I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. The lights are back on at Broadway theaters, and Tina, the Tina Turner musical, is one of the shows up for an award at this weekend's Tonys. In a few minutes, we'll talk to Times chief theater critic, Jesse Green, about the return of Broadway. But we begin with politics, a politically brutal August for President Biden. In the last weeks of September, his legacy, perhaps even his presidency, may be on the line. His $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill is on the agenda. Speaker Pelosi told moderates in her caucus, back the $3.5 trillion budget plan, and there'll be a vote on infrastructure by September 27th. The clock is ticking. And that massive spending package has so much in it, the Times wrote, quote, it is almost as if President Franklin Roosevelt had stuffed his entire New Deal into one piece of legislation. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin says he won't vote for that much spending, and the bill can't pass if the Democrats lose a single vote in the Senate. And true to form, Democrats are squabbling over everything from tax increases to drug pricing. And let's not forget, Congress has to okay funding to keep the government open and avoid a default. Meanwhile, Biden's poll numbers keep sliding. Reuters Ipsos has him underwater, 44% approve, 50% disapprove. But Fox has him with 50% approving and 49% disapproving. So what's the outlook for the Biden domestic agenda? And given COVID, Afghanistan sinking polls, how much political muscle does the president still have? We're joined by Peter Baker, the Chief White House Correspondent for the New York Times, and Reed Epstein, a Times Political Correspondent. Peter, looking ahead at the budget, at the deficit, at the infrastructure, what do you see coming up? Well, you see a giant traffic jam all in the next few weeks, basically, and with a lot at stake, as you, Sam, rightly put it, this bill, this one $3.5 trillion bill by itself, represents so many of the president's top priorities, not just on social spending, not just expanding the welfare uh, state, not just uh, uh, you know helping out from cradle to grave in terms of childcare, in terms of free co uh, community college education. It also includes things like climate change and other issues that he wants to make progress on. It had included immigration reform until the Senate parliamentarian just said, well, wait a second, that's not really a budget issue that you can use this particular form of legislation on. That may be a, a, an end to that particular part of the legislation. But he's got so much riding on this. And as you rightly point out, no margin for error. Zero votes in the Senate he can afford to lose because the 50-50 Senate with the vice president breaking a tie, three votes in the House is all the Democrats can afford to lose. And with so much squabbling between the progressives and moderates, it's gonna be a test of uh, President Biden's ability to forge coalitions within his own party, forget across the aisle. We're generally looking at the political scene on the basis of what we've seen so far this year. Uh, the Governor Newsom uh, avoided a recall, if that's a bellwether at all for 2022. How does uh, this budget crisis, this infrastructure vote, shape up in terms of looking ahead to 2022 and even 2024? Well, one thing that we've learned from the last couple uh, midterm elections, especially the first midterms of a presidency, is that voters judge the president's party based on what they've accomplished. Uh, one of the big complaints uh, that, we, that hurt President Obama was that he didn't get as much accomplished as he had said. Certainly President Trump, uh, the, the tax bill hurt him. Um, but he didn't have as many of the other conservative priorities as he had promised. If President Biden is not able to somehow get this across the line, uh, one of the things that we can expect to see in the next year in attacks against him is that he's an ineffectual leader and un unable to corral his own party uh, to, to push some of his priorities. It's the sort of thing that can both energize uh, opposition to him and uh, demoralize and deflate his own supporters. Peter, the deficit uh, and raising the debt ceiling, can you explain that to us? The Republicans are uh, usually concerned about that in the past couple of years have not been. Is that a big issue? Is that something I should lose sleep over? 
<laughs> well, look, you should at least sleep, sleep over only if, in fact, we decide to go over the cliff. We have this um, perennial uh, drama now in the last few years in which we drive right up to the cliff in which we say, oh, my gosh, we might not actually pass an increase in the debt limit. And, and if that's the case, the government, the federal government, the United States of America would go into default. And then at the last minute, they pull back and find a way to, to, to move on. Now, whether they'll actually go over the cliff, that's the moment you know that would genuinely cause people to, to stay up at night because it would be a, a financial and economic disaster for the country. Right now, the Republicans are saying they will not vote to raise the debt uh, limit and they'll leave it entirely to the Democrats, so they own that politically. Raising the debt limit, just to be clear, is only to pay for spending that's already been approved, often, by the way, approved by Republicans and Democrats. It's not uh, a way of saying we are going to spend more money necessarily is saying we're going to pay the bills that we already have incurred. It's in other words saying I'm going to pay the credit card that I've already taken to the store and bought that furniture. So uh, to not approve the increase in the debt ceiling doesn't affect future spending so much as simply, uh, you know, re act responsibly over the spending you've already approved. How much of this is uh, affecting Biden politically, Reid? Uh, we look at a lot of uh, signs uh, toward uh, the political impact of this. We're looking at COVID, we're looking at Afghanistan, but what about what's going on in Congress right now? Is he divorced from that? Is he leaving that to Congress or is he playing an active role? Well, he's certainly playing an active role or trying to appear to be playing an active role. Uh, we've seen this week he's had uh, Democrats from both the House and the Senate into the White House to talk to him. Um, but we, we have seen, like you said, sort of since uh, at the beginning of the Afghanistan troubles in late July and early August, his poll numbers have gradually receded. Uh, he had been above 50. Now he was a little bit below 50. There was a poll this week uh, from Iowa, from the Des Moines Register that showed his approval rating in Iowa is down to 31 percent, uh, as low as they've seen for any president since uh, the real doldrums of the George W. Bush administration. Uh, and so there's no question that his political standing across the country is lower now than it was uh, two or three months ago. Um, but the question is not as so much like what his political standing is now, is what is it going to be a year from now when people start mm -hmm. to vote in the midterm elections? Uh, there'll be certainly be signs of that come November in the governor's race, in, particularly in Virginia. Um, but he has a long time to to put his approval rating where it needs to be to help Democrats in the midterms. He doesn't have as much time to actually pass big legislation because once we get into the, the midterm election season, it becomes much more difficult to do so. And Peter, what about uh, Afghanistan? Uh, we're now looking at problems with immigrants from uh, Haiti as well. How is the president being viewed as handling these two arguably foreign policy issues, but issues that have become domestic problems as well? Uh, with these inevitable Afghanistan, could anyone have done it better? Or you know, is it uh, ultimately going to redound to the president as a positive that he finally got us out of there? Well, in Afghanistan, there's two different issues. Issues, right? There's the issue of whether we decided to stay or not. And on that, he's got a lot of support from the public. The public was tired of it. He basically reflects their exhaustion with the quote, forever war, the phrase he likes to use after 20 years. The sense was we've given enough treasure and blood to, to Afghanistan. It's up to them now. But then there's the second part of it. Uh, the second part of it, of course, is how you do that. And remember, he himself was the one who told us that it would be orderly. He told us that it was highly unlikely that the Taliban would take over right away. He told us that there was no circumstance, his words, that there would be a, a messy Saigon-like exit. And of course, all of those things turned out not to be true. So if, if to the extent that he now says, well, it was inevitable, it was going to be messy, he didn't tell us that at the beginning. He could have prepared the public a little bit more for that. Instead, I think you see these horrific images of obviously people who were you know, clinging onto planes, desperate to get out. We now see, of course, the results of the Taliban takeover with girls and, and uh, being, you know, kept out of schools, women once again, uh, you know, facing repression, uh, you know, examples of retribution against people who helped the Americans. Most Americans probably won't care about that as a matter of politics. They've given up on Afghanistan, but I think it also does provide ammunition to Republicans next year if they can combine it, as Reid said, with other failures. In other words, if they have an ad with these horrific images coming out of Afghanistan twinned with ads about like high gas prices or crime rates or inflation or a failure to pass uh, his infrastructure plan or something like that. All of that could be of a piece to make the case that he's not an effectual president. 
or he could have a very good next year and nobody will remember it at all. It's, it's, it's hard to say a year out because we are, you know, a year in the life of American politics is forever. It certainly is these days. Read on the COVID, uh, the president is taking the, uh, the position that uh, people are fed up with uh, people who are not getting the vaccine. Uh, is that going to hold? And is that a position that is designed to stimulate the economy or get rid of COVID? Or is the president latching on to what seems to be a popular mood at the moment? Well, it's certainly what the president and, and other Democrats, including Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom in California, Terry McAuliffe in Virginia, um, and, and Democrats elsewhere have realized is that this is a real wedge issue in, in the Republican Party. It splits the educated suburban Republicans with sort of the more rural Trumpy Republicans who are opposed to not just vaccine mandates, but and oftentimes the vaccine itself. It's a, almost a twofer for them. It has public health benefits by forcing vaccinations, helping the economy, and it, it divides the Republican Party. We saw it, there was a debate last week in Virginia uh, between Terry McAuliffe and his Republican opponent, Glenn Youngkin. And Youngkin tried to thread the needle a little bit between saying he was for vaccines, but he didn't want to force anyone to get a vaccine. As a, McAuliffe really pounced on that at, and argued that, that Youngkin and other Republicans were essentially prolonging the pandemic and hurting the economic recovery. Peter, Joe Manchin on voting rights. Uh, is that a big step in the right direction in terms of sort of bipartisanship in Washington, or is that a fluke? Well, I mean, it's bipartisanship if you consider Manchin to be, you know, not a complete Democrat, which is what the progressives would say. I mean, obviously, he would like to find a way to uh, bring in Republicans. I think the idea that there's going to be a bipartisan bill is pretty it's still pretty hard to imagine that because obviously this goes to the to the central issue of power in Washington. Who gets to have it? Who doesn't? And there's no way in today's hyperpolarized, I don't want to say no way, but there's very, you know, it seems very unlikely in today's hyperpolarized environment that you could have the two parties agree on a system of rules that both uh, both sides believe is fair because each side is trying to maximize the gain uh, for its side. So look, the question is whether Manchin can find an agreement in which he seems to be uh, moving toward with his fellow Democrats to put uh, forward a voting rights bill that will get through, and then, in which case it would go to the House, and again, probably be a partisan vote on the part of Democrats. Uh, you know, it's, it's I, I, I wouldn't bet on anything at this point in, in Washington, but it seems to be moving in somewhat in that direction. Reed, speaking of power in Washington, one of the big things that will determine power in Washington over the next decade is reapportionment. Uh, what are we learning from the census figures as to how that's going to play out? Well, we've seen some of the preliminary maps from some of these states have come out, uh, and and we're really seeing each party try to maximize the number of seats that they control. Uh, we've seen in Ohio, uh, they've used a creative interpretation of the state constitution uh, to determine that Republicans had won 80 percent of statewide elections over the last year. Therefore, they could draw 80 percent of the legislative seats in Ohio for Republicans. Uh, we've seen in Oregon the pr a preliminary map uh, that draws five out of the six congressional seats as, as heavily Democratic districts. And so we can expect to see more of that, particularly in states where one party controls uh, the, re the redistricting and reapportionment. States like New York and Illinois are going to draw heavily Democratic maps. States like Texas, uh, Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia are going to draw heavily Republican maps. The side that is on the short end is going to go to court and wail about it, but uh, we've seen the Supreme Court has effectively said that that political gerrymandering is allowed, and, and there's no reason to believe that they're going to it's going to change its mind. That's uh, fascinating. That uh, you know, Elbridge Gerry was right all along, I guess. For Elbridge Gerry, he, he pronounced it Gerry. The pronunciation. Gerry, you're, you're absolutely years. right. Forgive me. Uh, Peter Baker, uh, a lot of new books coming out on the 2020 election, even as we look forward to 2024. You and your wife writing one, Maggie Haberman of the Times, Jonathan Martin, Alex Burns, Jeremy Peters. What have we learned from the most recent books that have come out? Is there anything new that has been said that has shed some light on the 2020 election and on the Trump administration? Yeah, I think we've had a few books come out in the last few uh, weeks, including obviously most prominently this past week, uh, Bob Woodward and Robert Costa's book, Peril. I think what we learned or what we sort of are reminded of is just how fraught 
that period between November 6th, the election, and January 6th, the uh, insurrection on Capitol Hill really were. And just how much the country was teetering on an edge of, of a place that it has never been in modern times. We didn't know where it could end up. It was so volatile, so risky, so in jeopardy that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, uh, was busy making sure that nobody was able to do something outside of the bounds of the, of the normal process. Now, he's gotten a lot of heat because I think people have, have, have twisted some of the things that he did do in something that, that didn't happen. For instance, he gave this call, he made a call where he actually spoke with by phone his Chinese counterpart twice to say, look, just because you see instability on television doesn't mean that we're in, uh, you know, unstable. We're not planning to attack you. There was worry that China would interpret, misinterpret what's happening here. Chairmen of the Joint Chief, ch top generals do that all the time uh, with their counterparts, trying to make sure there are no accidental wars. But this has been interpreted as being uh, uh, you know, a treasonous act against President Trump. But it does reflect, I think, how worried he was and how worried other people were at that moment. He also sat down with the Joint Chiefs and said, look, if you get an order for military action, particularly for nuclear action, there is a process, there is a procedure, and you make sure that you follow that legal process and do not simply take orders from people who say they represent the president or, or are going outside of uh, the normal process. Again, people are saying he was, you know, he was the one being outside the process, but in fact, what he was trying to say is don't do anything rash, don't allow anybody else to, to operate outside of the normal process. It shows how, how fraught, again, that period really was in our history. Well, more to the coming books from you and other Times reporters as well. Thanks to Peter Baker, Reed Epstein of the New York Times. And coming up next, Broadway is back. So the Tony Awards, we'll talk to Times Chief Theater critic in a moment. Actors, singers, dancers back on the boards on Broadway after the COVID pandemic brought down the curtain in March of 2020. The Tony Awards set for this Sunday, Moulin Rouge scored an amazing 14 nominations, including Best Musical. It's a jukebox musical based on the 2001 movie directed by Baz Luhrmann. Slave Play received 12 nominations, including Best Play. It's about race, sex, power, and interracial relationships. The Times called it, quote, one of the best and most provocative new works to show up on Broadway in years. The Times chief drama critic, Jesse Green, wrote that review. He joins us to talk about the Broadway season and to preview this weekend's Tony Awards. And Jesse, what are you looking forward to this season? Well, I'm looking forward to uh, some sort of return to normalcy on the one hand and some sort of return to not normalcy on the other hand, by which I mean, obviously, being in theater spaces with other people safely uh, is going to be a wonderful change for me, having spent the last 18 months basically glued to the computer screen watching things that way. So, uh, and, and some shows have begun to reopen and the feelings in the theater in the theaters is electric. It's really amazing what people are experiencing being back in those spaces, hearing the laughter, uh, feeling the kind of percussive effects of actual nearby emotion right on your face. So that's wonderful. But when I say different, I also mean we can't really be the same industry and the same art form we were 18 months ago, given all the things that have happened in between. And uh, I think there's signs of that change coming and I'm, I'm happy for it. Two of the things you wrote about at the Times that really are quite fascinating. One, the disproportionate compared to other years number of uh, black playwrights represented on Broadway and also the number of experimental plays, you would call them formally inventive as you put it, plays and the fact that it is because of the pandemic perhaps, because of the fact that there are not that many foreign tourists immediately, uh, that Broadway can afford to experiment. Is that right? That's certainly part of it. I mean, uh, traditionally the uh, big commercial shows, the biggest musicals do depend after they, you know, eat through the New York local audience on tourists to, uh, to keep them going and to pay off their costs. A lot of those shows are staying away uh, until they're sure what's going on and that leaves some open theaters. And it also means that producers and particularly theater owners are more willing to take some chances on material 
that they didn't before because these shows do not necessarily require tourist audiences to do well or well enough. So we have in the fall alone, uh, seven, uh, seven shows, I believe, by Black authors opening on Broadway, which to my knowledge has never happened before. And quite a few, uh, some of those and some others as well are, as you say, works that would prior, previously maybe be considered almost avant-garde, works following in the tradition of slave play, which you mentioned, and uh, what the Constitution means to me, which was the hit before the pandemic. What are some of the ones you have looking forward to and actually have also recently reviewed? Well, I have reviewed only one that has opened uh, and that's called Passover, uh, which was done off Broadway before the pandemic and uh, opened on Broadway in August. Uh, this is a very fine play uh, that sort of takes uh, the story of the biblical exodus and uh, enslaved people on plantations and also Beckett's Waiting for Godot and mashes them together into a story about Black youth in a city uh, endangered by police violence. And it's very powerful and challenging. And, you know, whether it succeeds financially or not is the kind of thing that I'd like to see getting its turn in the country's major spotlight for theater. There's so many plays coming that are just not what you would expect to find on Broadway. It'll be a great time, I think, especially for New Yorkers, but also for adventurous people from out of town to see material that they would have had to go, have gone off or even off off Broadway to find in the past. Some of those you mentioned, Dana H., Is This a Room, uh, The Last of the Love Letters, Sanctuary City. Uh, now, of these plays that would normally have opened off Broadway, and if so, what is filling those spaces? Oh, well, Dana H. and Is This a Room did open off-Broadway, and actually before that, they even opened further away. I mean, they were in small experimental spaces pre-off-Broadway. And as much as I loved them when I saw them in those spaces uh, a year and a half, a year or two years ago, I, I would never have dreamed that they would come to Broadway. They're both, the, the two I just mentioned, have a specific uh, technique about them that is still considered avant-garde, which is that they use transcripts as the basis of, of their dramaturgy. And in one case, they actually lip sync the transcript. And in another, in the other case, they perform the transcript. And it sounds off-putting or maybe uh, abstract, but it's in fact a really powerful and moving experience. And these are also um, based on real things. We watch reality TV. I don't know why we can't consider watching reality theater also. That's true. Some of the big shows uh, coming up, uh, the Lehman Trilogy coming to Broadway, The Music Man, uh, which I guess we haven't seen on Broadway in a long time. Uh, what else uh, is coming that you're looking forward to? Those are two that I'd like to see. Well, I certainly want to see those. I, I have seen the Lehman Trilogy. That was done uh, at the Park Avenue Armory a couple years back, slightly new cast. Um, so that's, that's uh, going to be an interesting experience. Um, I'm really interested in two of the revival musicals just because they are great musicals and I wonder what what they will look like in our new environment. One is Company, the Stephen Sondheim, George Firth musical from 1970, which is going to look quite different on the surface because instead of having as its main character a bachelor named Bobby, uh, the main character is a bachelorette named Bobby, mm. i.e., and some of the story has been gender switched uh, to support that, some of it has not. So I'm quite interested in that. And the great musical Caroline or Change, which was on Broadway a number of years ago, was not a financial success, uh, but is a, an extremely powerful work. And yet it's a work by white authors about a, whose main character is a woman who, uh, is a black woman who works as a domestic in a, the home of a Jewish family in Louisiana. And I'm, Curious to see how that feels now. I remember seeing that with Larry Keith when uh, it uh, was on Broadway the last time around. Uh, what were all these actors, uh, stagehands, other people doing uh, all this time? Suffering, basically. Uh, particularly the younger ones who had barely gotten a chance to begin establishing contacts and, and day jobs that might have helped them through. A lot of the day jobs disappeared as well waiting on tables, things like paralegal work. And many people went home to their parents and lived in their childhood homes. Uh, obviously, 
those who were further along in their careers couldn't necessarily do that. Uh, they did a lot of online theater. As I say, I spent many, many hours glued to this screen uh, looking to see what is this new form and should it continue even after live theater returns? And I have mixed feelings about that. Um, and a lot of people did benefits, raising a tremendous amount of money to help people who were suffering with COVID and other problems related to the lack of work and uh, studying and also apparently anecdotally eating a lot is what I hear. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. Jesse Green, Chief Theater Critic for the New York Times, thank you so much for joining us and we'll look forward to the season and the Tonys. For the New York Times and for CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.